or they reversed it essentially assuming r right seven six r they've just assumed r is in there um so anyway um all right uh this is chris's floor example real quick so this is the um the the lower floor building compression rate right within different days and and different uh levels of compression and where the apparent water line was and um i kind of go through that a little bit so um so can I just ask here, do you think that there's um, a, a fatabromosa going on there? So I look, fatabromosa, that's, that's the, um, I, I, I only looked at fatabromosa, um, fatamorgana is the inversions on inversions, right? But bromosa yeah. is the, um, is that the, that's the superior mirage, right? Uh, well, well, that's the water essentially repeating itself higher than it actually is. So it's, it's, it's basically copying the water underneath, like a fatter promoter of the water. Oh, sorry, a fatter Morgana of the water. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I just think in terms of refraction at this point. Um, um, but the, the fatter Morgana is the inversions on inversions. Um, so it's like cold air, cold, cold, warm, cold, warm, like almost like a ripple effect. And you get these like something's upright and then it's inverted and then it's upright again that that to me is a fata morgana okay um but I, again i have to look into what they're defining as bromosa and morgana i haven't i looked at it once and i just don't remember the details i'm sorry um but but i don't think that's what's occurring here i just think again i just think this is upward refraction phenomenon um and you're pushing you're pushing the visible world lower, right? Um, your horizon line is lower in this view. You're viewing more of the building as if you were higher up. You're still getting compressive effects, again, within this, this differential upward rate. Um, they're, they're all essentially tied together as, as one phenomenon. So it compresses and it drops it as well. Exactly. Okay. You can tell too, I mean, look how big this stack is up here. It's huge, right? This is not, this is three floors worth. So let me go to this next one. This is his, this is Chris showed this. And so I Google snapped it or whatever, but this, this top of this thing is worth three floors. Okay. So you start comparing his images on this day, which was crystal clear. Okay. And then you compare it to this day and then this day and you start like, well, how much does that stratify to the floors? Well, on this day, it was worth four floors on this day. It was worth four and a half floors. And on this day, we were back to four floors, but we were seeing more. Everything was pushed down. It's like these two effects, right? Your visible world is pushed down as if you're seeing more from a higher height, and you're getting these differential compressions within it. Okay, and Chris, I, Chris, oh, Chris, you're yeah. still here, yeah? So, yeah. So, so you, obviously film, you obviously filmed these, yeah? So what were you thinking when you saw these? Because I know that you'd seen The Lighthouse at some point last year or something. And before you got the P1000, and this is P1000 footage, yeah? Mm -hmm. So what were you thinking at this time when you were seeing this this blockage at the bottom? Did you did you consider it as being some kind of upward refraction? I bet you didn't, because <laughs> uh, I'll bet you didn't. <laughs> well, yeah, well the, the thing is with these this building, is called the Towers of Kiba Skiing. This was, well, around the time that I got the P1000, this was sort of a new building for me. I hadn't really been focusing on it. Um, I've been really focusing on the lighthouse. So with these, um, yeah, it's just that there was a million things going through my mind, but I I had seen your Steta line footage with the compression. So I had an inkling and of an idea that this compression effect does exist, but I, I think it wasn't until I got home maybe and I looked over the footage that I began to notice that the balconies towards the bottom were squashed. And uh, then I've just put two and two together with, you know, the Steneline stuff and the compression you've showed. And I was like, okay, well, this could be that same or at least a similar type of compression effect. And, you know, then I start talking about, you know, well, you know, if it's compressing near the bottom, um, then that can give you a, a, an impression that it's disappearing bottom up. And uh, so, you know, it's just it's as you know, as we can as we've all <laughs> witnessed right here, it's, it's insanely complex. But uh, yeah, I'll just toss it back to Travis. Yeah. Well, okay. let, let me show kind of real quick. Or sorry, go ahead, Ranty. Sorry. So, so when we're looking at this stuff, and they're talking about um, 
refraction. Do you think they've taken refraction and tried to hijack it from the flat Earth? Because what I'm learning from uh, Travis right now is that this upward refraction actually uh, pushes what you're viewing beyond, you know, down. It pushes it down behind the the blockage in the foreground, which would be the water. So the water's in the foreground. Things in the distance are being um, refracted down by upward compression, uh, sorry, upward refraction. So, and also where it meets the horizon line, you get this compression. So not only is it being refracted down, but it's actually being compressed at the horizon as well. Well, so, it's not being refracted down. It's being refracted up and visible down. I know it's ter terminology, but it's yeah. Terminology, yeah. So refracted up, so it brings the building down, but it's being compressed at the horizon. It's, it's, it's a combination effect, yeah. So so here, here's this purple line, okay? This well, purple can, line. Can we, just, can we just, like, clarify right now that yeah. we, we do not see or have never evidenced any kind of looming in their model? Their, their model uh, asserts that we can see looming, you know, refracted up, right? I've never, ever, ever seen this. I the, have, the only evidence I've, I've personally not seen that. Evidence, sorry, the, the only thing I've seen of looming is that, like, say Chris takes this footage of this day, like right here, and he says, look at how much of this building I can see. Um, and and that's not possible on a flat or on, on, a, on a globe. And then the counter is, uh, well, that's looming. That's that's the only thing I guess I've seen. So yeah, yeah. So it does a, they they come back with looming, but but it's never been evidenced anywhere. No no global has ever been able to prove it. I've never been able to prove it. But we can account for blockage at the bottom, and and what you're actually demonstrating here is that that building could be subject to some kind of upward refraction that drops the height of it. And that at the horizon, the apparent horizon line, we get this compression, this optical effect where the the hot the the, the hot and the air mix, uh, the hot and the cold mix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here's what I tried to do. Here is the um, here's the distant tree line, and so this purple line, I've standardized this line across his images, and I'll show you how I did that next here. But so see how this red line, this apparent water line, is brought lower right so you're just seeing more and more degrees of, of upward refraction and you're seeing more and more of the floors you're getting a artificially induced height just like we showed with your time lapse footage you're artificially inducing a height change just like what i'm representing here with this building you're seeing the world you br you're bringing the visible world lower okay that's that's what that means that's what upward refraction is doing all these light rays coming to your eye are bent through this less dense layer you're bring you're assuming straight lines and bringing the entire visible world lower. Do you know and what I find amazing is that they termed upward refraction and downward refraction as to, to mean the opposite as what you know as to what you would expect them to mean. Right. You know? right. Yeah. But, you have to so, kind of reverse it, but yeah. Yeah. So no yeah. One. Upward refraction means you're seeing down. Oh, well, sorry, that it's being bent down. It's like that is so back to front. So in a minute, I'll show you, yeah, I know it's, it's, it's kind of a, but in a minute, I'll show you kind of how, um, essentially they, or I would say they, who, whoever, right. Are telling you that these times when you're seeing the most refraction is the true, the true thing. And these times here where you're seeing little refraction to none and the water temperature and air temperature are exactly the same and you have no compression and you can see miles is the false one okay so this this right here where chris is zoomed out this is false okay that's that's the argument that's what i have a hard time with so among other things i guess so yeah. let, let me show you how it stays when you've got the best imagery and it's got the least interference the least waviness the least messed upness or in the case of chris's images with these squashed bottoms when you've got the least effect that's when they claim there's looming. Right. Whereas when you've got this effect and you've got all sorts of refraction effects and um, mirages, that's when they claim the earth curve's getting in the way and there's no refraction. Right. Or well, that's when it starts to match up better to the earth curve calculator. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, 
So here's how I kind of standardized his photos. Again, I, I, I took it through, I, I zoomed in on these. He was able to capture this, um, this tree in all of these, you know, he's that little bit left or right of it, but he still was able to capture the, the tree, right? Um, and so when you do this and you, and you, you know, draw your line, this is the third photo right here. This, this one right here is the day where he had no, like the water temperature and the air temperature were the same. Okay. So I used that as my baseline. And what I did was, um, I took a point on that zoomed in photo and I, um, I took it as though it were about six feet, right? Cause his observer height is six feet. So I tried to estimate where about six feet off the distant shoreline might be. It might be a little bit higher here, but, but give or take. Okay. Um, and I, I use that, that is going to be my, my standard now. Okay. And then I zoom out and away from it and I standardized it across where that point, which is right here in this, this photo, where that crossed this green plant. Okay. Where it crossed this green foliage that was in his uh, foreground. All right. And that's my standard. That's my baseline. Right. And then I compared all of his other images to where that was in relation to that um, tree or to that foliage. Right. So what you see is that in all the other cases, the ho apparent horizon is lower than that line, not higher, which makes sense well, to us, I guess, at this point. But it contradicts the other issue. So look at it across this view. Here's the purple line. Uh, at the six foot mark across the distant shoreline and uh, same thing here, same thing here. And the horizon, the apparent horizon, right? Where the apparent water line is, is lower. Okay. Make sense? It does. Okay. Now yeah. in the, um, and I just kind of sequentially blew up each one to get closer and closer into the view. So here we're zoomed out within the first uh, footage he took that one day. Uh, it was like 17, I think it was Chris, or maybe no, it was October 18, somewhere in there. Um, and then, uh, and I kind of standardized this line across the, uh, using the water line, right? So the water line is my, is and, and the, the level above the water line remain the same here. And the level above the water line remain the same and so forth, okay? Um, except here where we have a inferior mirage, okay? So in here we don't have inferior mirages, right? So we have to use the apparent water line. Here, we have an inferior mirage, so that's not our, our false horizon, right? Our false horizon is the point of inflection on the building. And so when you standardize that, you see again, and the apparent water line is even lower now, right? Not only is the whole entire image brought lower, because that's the inflection point of the, of the buildings, but the apparent water line is even, is far lower than any of the other images. Yeah, in, in fear and mirages drop the height of the horizon absolutely because they repeat the sky down over the water. And that, exactly right. Yes, but but not only that, right? But the top, the stacks of this condominium are even lower when you had that inferior mirage zone, right? It's yeah. even more refraction going on, upward refraction of the entire visual world, right? Makes sense. Yep. Okay. Um, so again, I, I thought that's pretty cool. I just don't see, I just don't see downward refraction, um, as a thing. So, um, so, uh, Chris then panned out, um, and he released this foot. Uh, so what's interesting too, so this footage here, this footage three that he took, this footage four was taken the very next day, right, Chris? <laughs> Um, I don't remember exactly, but I think I did go out the next day, and I think it was completely different. Right. I, I think I, on the video it says like this is just like the day after or something. Um, that this footage down here was taken from this footage, so um, you can just see within a different day. And I'm assuming the temperature didn't change drastically, but it may have. I don't know. But look at the, just the choppiness of the waves. Maybe the waves are now e emitting more. Um, more uh, water vapor layer, you know, more of a less dense layer because of all the choppiness. Who, who knows? I don't know. Um, but but it's a, it's occurring. So the effect we'll have to figure out. Um, but he then um, panned away and um, looked at the Miami skyline. And so I started to do some calculations for because I'm assuming again that there's almost no refraction in in these in this this day's footage. So I encourage you to go check it out because it's really it's crystal clear. And so 
he gets out in this case, I want to say the skyline was, I don't know where I calculated at here, 17 miles. So this is at 17 miles and you can see there's, we're starting to get some, some cutoff here um, with the buildings. And again, I think it's, it's mainly because we're just, we're just getting dimmer light, right? Our refraction angle is starting to revert from a lower arc minute, you know, maybe like it was 0.1 or I think I calculated out. It's like in, in the, it was like 0.00, uh, you know, five or something when he was looking at the condominium that day because of how much of the, shoreline he was able to see there but um but then um as he gets you know he's seeing through more and more atmosphere and less and less of those lower wavelengths you know the refracted uh or the non-refracted wavelengths which are like the reds and stuff they're they're kind of getting through i'm not saying he's seeing the world in red i'm just saying that he's seeing the world in higher wavelengths um and you're also probably getting a little bit of a more dimming so so some of those calculations with abby and rayleigh um start to allow theta to get a little bit higher and so somewhere in the distance here, we start to reach that one arc minute resolution and you start to see the, the cutoff occurring and the rate at which it's cut off. I just do a bunch of calculations. And so, um, so here, I think we were supposed to lose, I don't know what it is here. I don't remember 31 feet. And so if you compare uh, 31 feet right here of, of where this thing is to where this object that's, it's about 30 feet, right? I mean, it's kind of cool how that works out, but do you see how those steps have actually sort of like they've gone straight then they've gone they've, they've been pulled downwards and then flattened out right so that's what i was saying too they're kind of you're starting to see this compression effect starting at, at you know as as the kind of the refraction start, or the um as yeah as the refraction starts to kick in you're starting to see compression and expansion effects and you can kind of see you can see look at the building here right look at the lower floors they're a little bit expanded these ones here in the middle are a little bit more compressed and it gets expanded again it's like you know again looking through water wave right okay. so um so chris, then i did what, some more what do, you, what do you think of the the analysis chris yeah i was blown away <laughs> i couldn't believe that this guy i mean he didn't even tell me he was doing this stuff you know but you know one day he just pops his video out and he's got like an hour's worth of analysis like honestly it felt great because i didn't have to do the fucking analysis you know like I mean, and, you know, uh, Travis went, you know, super deep here. So it's, yeah, it's just, it's amazing, man. It's really incredible. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, you, you can't, but that's, that's my other point too. You can't, you can't do the analysis without the data. So um, yeah. I think the observations are, are, are critical. So, um, so the, um, so then I took, he, he panned across and you're just seeing the same refracted, or di sorry, diffracted. So, so, so Nathan, in this case, this, this to me is diffraction, right? Um, this very clear demarcation where the things above are essentially not compressed or, or having all weird effects, just like, like the flashlight or the book example that the guy sent trying to debunk the angle of attack. There's no compression. You're just getting a straight cutoff line, right? And um, so he pans across this thing and you see, and I was able to identify that this was the Carnival Horizon, right? And then this bridge right here, I used a bunch of, this is the William Powell Bridge. Um, and then this thing, and Chris mentioned this one in one of his, is the Carillion Hotel and Spa, right? And so um, when, so I tried to quantify like, well, how much of this boat is cut off, right? How much of this bridge is cut off? And so um, if you look at this boat here, so this, you can just see kind of where the bow is right here. Um, and, um, and so I kind of quantified where the orange line or the orange rectangle is essentially what I'm calling like cut off. Um, but I'm just kind of spitballing it a little bit in that case. It looks like about three to four decks to me. Um, and then uh, uh, essentially like the lower half of the, or the lower, the part where the, um, what do you want to call it? The, uh, I don't know, ship terminology. The, where the decks, where the passenger decks and the lifeboats, you know, you can almost kind of make out the lifeboats a little bit through there, um, but it's kind of hard to see. So but I, I just took it as this bottom part of the boat. And then the William Powell Bridge, um, what, what's cut off here. So what I did was I counted the pylons for, it looks like the arc of the bridge, right, is right here. And I counted the number of pylons that were, were here and then correlated to a, a photo. And then um, when you do that, you get about eight pylons worth before it disappears. So I took, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then I took that as my line. And then the rest of it was cut off, right? 
and so what you end up with is this is a 77 foot bridge and so you're losing about half of it more or less 35 feet the Carillion hotel and spa is a little bit more difficult it's just kind of too far off in the distance and i couldn't count the floors um but i tried a couple different ways um so we can we can you know just take that one off the map for now but um but regardless for the william powell bridge at least i thought it was kind of cool you're losing 35 feet and it's um uh, which is what you would roughly want at 19 miles. The um, Carnival Horizon lost about 30 feet, which and it's at 17 miles. It's it's docked at um, I think it's Dodge Island. Um, so anyway, uh, I just thought it was cool. And, and it's, here's my point about all this: it's linear, right? It's a linear angle um, spreading out into the into the distance. So um, as, as these things descend, you know, within perspective their setting within the diffraction uh, limit, right? And the rate at which they descend. Ranty's turbines is always going to be the best example of that. Yeah, like like setting. Um, again, er everything sets, right? The sun sets, these, these distant things set. Um, so anyway, um, what else we got here? Okay, so this is Sally's bridge. Um, so I kind of was like, well, what's going on here? But if you look at the bridge, um, this is the bridge, by the way, right? This this is the bridge from however many feet up, okay? Now, this bridge at some point is supposed to turn into this, right? Um, in, in Like physically. But I, I just can't, I can't come to terms with that. Um, and so um, what, what's happening here is that this, this um when this footage is taken i don't know if this particular google image or whatever i got this one from google um i don't think it was from Sally, but it, it could have been um but this one is at lakes it, it's at the same elevation where Sally does the um the his stuff right so lake i think it's lake center or lake plot i forget what it is but it's like, it's like pontius up or he, he's up above the water line right yeah it's like pontius train Right. This is like Ponch Train, but I think it's like Lake Center or something where he takes the where you take the photo from to All get right. there. okay. Um so um because it's elevated, right? You can see it's like and I think it's like 15 floors up or something to take this photo. So his horizon point or his vanishing line would be roughly at a 15 floor, however many uh right, his true horizon line would be out that far. So these two railroad tracks, let's call it, they would go off in i guess the real world whatever you want to say they would go off into the distance and and vanish at a point right um whatever his elevation was just like how i'm showing here so far so good yep okay so but where's his water line his water line is lower right his water line's right here he's dropped his horizon right He's artificially dropped his horizon. And like I said, the air temperature was colder where he was um, on New Year's or wherever it was done. Down here, the water was warmer. And they showed the um, NOAA or uh, NOAA data or whatever it's called. Right? It's getting late. Sorry. <laughs> so, no, it's um, so anyway, what, what's happening is you're just seeing. So I kind of modeled out here. You, th these rays that are more distant are more are getting bent. Or, 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 or you're receiving a greater arc worth of bend um, the further away the bridge is, okay? So the bridge is sending off these rays, right? These are experiencing more of an arc before they hit your eye. And the arc lessens as, as the uh, bridge gets closer to you in proximity. Mm -hmm. So far, so good? Yeah. Okay, so when you straighten this thing out, these distant rays here are going to drop this thing a lot more than closer in. So what ends up happening when you rotate this bridge here upward within perspective and the floor meets the ceiling, the further parts of the bridge are brought lower, okay? And you have a now a false lower horizon line, which is what we showed with all these other uh, effects, okay? Yeah. Um, all right, well, that, that's all. Does so that make sense, everybody? Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Nice and okay. I mean, I, I think that's what's what's going on. So, anyway, um, and you can kind of prove this with the um, the power lines, right? 
So um, the power lines are also taken as a proof of curvature. Um, but uh, some people have gone out and done the done the power lines on different days, and they 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 go along perfect orthogonal lines to a vanishing point, right on a on a clear day. Okay, and so um, when you do this, you can you can take like the same um, uh, landmarks within each of these um, these uh, uh, towers, right? And that's your orthogonal line. And you just standardize it across and it gets lower and lower and lower and lower until there's a horizontal landmark, right? Doesn't change throughout your field of view. Well, that's your horizon line, okay? And then it starts to ascend, right? It's steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper. And those are your other orthogonal lines. So that's what I did. And that's that's my horizon line, okay? And I did the same across the, the bendy one. Um, and what you see in that, when you do that, is that the horizon is brought lower again, right? It's an artificial lowered horizon, and you're receiving more bent rays from the further away it is, and you're now pushing it down lower within your visual field. Um, so, and, this, so this is upward refraction, yeah? Which is, uh, typical, yeah, so. which, is, which is typical of the conditions just over water. Yeah, exactly. Now I know I think it was uh, Karen B. Some, some other people have done it because of the bend of the of the of the power lines, but that may be part of it. But I, I think honestly, you're just looking at upward refraction again. I mean, it sounds weird that with like upward refractions, like this like uh, well, holy uh, grail of all this stuff. But I, I think it explains almost all of this. I would I would kind of disagree. It's it is upward refraction where you are getting this downward point at the top. But then you're also seeing this doubling back, which is an inferior mirage. So you're getting an inferior mirage at the horizon line, and then you're getting a, a, a shallow drop due to this upward refraction. So it's a, it's a combination of the two. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree with that at all. I, I guess what I'm I'm pointing to more the top of, of the power lines. Uh, we'll call it that. How about that? Yeah, um, sure. Going on below, I agree with you. I think you're just obscuring things within. Uh, but but I'm talking about like what what's above your eye line in this in this situation. Right. What you're saying is the light rays, which on your top left hand picture, as they're bending up, so upward refraction, your eye is going to naturally interpret that as though it is being received in a straight line, and right. therefore it's going to rebend that out. Well, in doing so, it forces the thing down. And on the top, well, middle right, if you like, the one with the black arrow pointing up to it, you've got the, the depiction again of the horizon being dropped. So those two combination of things is going to give you an artificially induced arc. Right. It's what we've seen in all these other, all these other cases, right? This artificially dropped horizon line and then these refractive effects. Um, so, yeah, so just picture in your head... Like look at look at the curve rate on this arc right here, and I did all these 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 are the exact same arc rate right within them, but I just I just brought them closer and closer to you. So look at the distance between this arc and then this black line. Okay, now these black dotted lines were standardized across where that arc or, or where that arc received or hit your eye, and so look at the difference between this point to this point. This point it gets less and less and less and then there's very little difference between this ray here and this dotted line here in other words there's very little push downward or you know effect of the proximal bridge and there's much greater on the the um you know the 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 furthest part of the bridge so the bridge appears to bend down so hopefully that makes sense yeah the thing that proves this out is the people have gone out and caught it when it's had less of this upward refraction right like this day here it's crystal it's a nice day that that you can see that the horizon line um the true kind of the water line is very near where the horizon where the where the eye line is right it's it's right at you know this this horizontal orthogonal line so um so then i thought this was cool i rewatched the um stephen hawking genius episode again yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Just, just going yeah, back to, that, to sure. that image where you've got the, you've got no upward refraction versus versus the upward refraction. Can you see how where you've got your red line going through? 
you've got this on the right hand side you've got the uh, inferior mirage which is essentially mimicking the sky above it and it's covering up the actual water underneath it yeah i, I would agree with that like this is this right here where my cursor is that's all reflection and not yeah, yeah, and if you go if you go down to the to the images beneath, you've got two images beneath. Um, yeah, you've got one on the left which shows no, you know, no discernible curvature, and then on the right hand side you've got this curve. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, what we're looking at is, you know, an inferior mirage of the sky, which is, you know, covering up the water underneath and blocking it out. So, so if there was water behind that sky you wouldn't see it because it's hidden behind the sky yeah no the sky, I, I, the sky I is hiding it. but it's not the real sky it's a fake sky uh, yeah well it's a, i guess inferior mirage shows the inverted sky yeah yeah so it's, it's a fake image it's a fake sky hiding the distant horizon whatever that may be if it's a boat that was behind there you wouldn't see the boat if it was a land mass you wouldn't see the land Right. It would it would be hiding no, it. That's that's that purple line, right? That purple line is your diffraction limit. Okay. Anything beyond that purple line is going to be setting within your visual field. Yes, yeah, it's, like there, it's, it's gone, it's vanished. Yeah, but anything un underneath that, you know, on the right hand side would be hidden by the sky. The yes. Uh, as long as it didn't reach the diffraction limit. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. As long as it was close enough to not reach the diffraction limit. Yeah. Yeah. So the inferior mirage hides the bottom of stuff or all of stuff, essentially. Um, yeah. In effect, it does. Um, but like we showed with the boats, you know, your true horizon is is higher up within that in, is as the inflection point of the inferior mirage. And so as the boat gets away, you don't even see the boat get get up to that purple line um it never reaches that far because the it starts to get consumed within that refractive layer before consumed. it ever reaches that i love it nathan consumed write that down mate yeah okay i can see Granty. you're right i'm wrong no it worries gets, it gets consumed yeah okay i get how it how awesome is that word uh, god you have nerve me gloating when it's been right and it has been the angle have you <laughs> it gets consumed nathan <laughs> but you know we're just it's all you know anyway all right the, so I, I wanted to watch the um the stephen hawking thing again because they did this laser experiment um and i they standardized a boat right have you have you guys seen this thing i'm sure you have yes no. so what they did was they standardized a boat at like 500 feet away i forget what the specifics were but they standardized it with this laser and they put this laser like two feet above the water and they made it all horizontal and everything and they shine a light on this boat and then this boat heads off to three miles okay and for a split second they show the laser beam right um <laughs> at at like three miles away and what and look at it right um it's it's got the same pattern as you know john d's kind of um depictions of 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 the upward refraction phenomenon right so i just thought that was cool they showed it for like a split second and then they, so i just tried to screen capture it um when they showed it but but regardless of that so he he marks this guy gets up and he um marks the boat the where the laser hits on the boat okay and they calculate it out and they're like whoa it's six feet higher right and so they're like that's earth curve so this boat descended across bendy water right the water bended down and this boat, uh, this laser was pointing straight the whole time, and this boat descended, and now he's marking, uh, the, you know, lower than the laser height, right? And that's Earth curve. Um, so two two issues. Um, first one is is that they didn't take into account the height of the laser above the water line, which is like what you say, like two feet at least, right? Um, and so uh, the amount of curvature you know that they would actually experience at three miles is much less than six feet okay but it's like they were matching the earth curve calculator uh you know for their observation that 
that are regardless of that. Um, so their version of reality is that the laser was straight and the water is bent, right? And I think what's happening is that the laser was bent and the water was straight, okay? So um, anyway, so that was kind of cool. Nice. Um, so then I just kind of uh, clean up this last one here by going through uh, Zach, uh, Good Times for All. Um, and I think, Nathan, you, you actually put me onto this one when you mentioned it one day in your, uh, in your show um, where you were like, you know, I, I, I saw like Zach, you know, he did these experiments with this lid. Um, and so I went and checked out his channel and, um, and, and pulled out his footage and um, tried to standardize everything with what, with what I knew at that point. Um, and so what he did was he took a lid and he did a hundred, uh, about every 20 to 40 feet. He did it every 20 feet, I think, but I just took it out for every 40 feet. So I didn't want to have this thing all the way across the screen. Um, and so he put this lid on the ground. He put a, a, a piece of paper next to it and marked out the inches. And then um, he just uh, took his camera back and it was like, you know, it was on the ground, I think it was, or like a, one observer height is 1.5 inches. And he just took this camera back um, to about 460 feet. And so um, when he did this, you start to see this mirage zone occur, right? So we know now why that's occurring because you are now see this 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 the the um the cement of of his warehouse wherever he was 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 doing it was emitting right it was an emission refraction phenomenon um it was a little bit warmer than the air um within his warehouse and so um as he's do, seeing these shallow angles he's not seeing the floor he's seeing the reflected sky just like we've talked about right um and so you can you use that as your uh, your horizon line, right? Or your, where, where the floor actually is, right? Is at this inflection point. So far, so good? Yeah, but you also see where the, uh, the center blue circle on the right-hand side is almost on the blue line. It's being dragged down. No, th and that's exactly my point. So I yeah. then pulled out 100 feet and 460 feet, and he had a blue line like here, but I, I, moved, I moved it to where I think the inflection point really is, which is the purple line okay so that's where you're seeing the blue and the purple there but so when i did that and i put the my purple line now on the blue line for where the lid is in the 100 foot example i i just decreased the um opacity of the uh photo and and blew it up and you can see that what's dropped is about 1.75 inches right so let me get the line so where my impression was to say that Man, I've literally in the last couple of days gone on record that the mirage is caused by the angle, and it's not. So what you're saying is the amount that he's lost from the bottom of these paint cans, that where you've now drawn a, a purple line as opposed to a blue, blue line, is actually how much he's losing to the angle. But the right. mirage is caused by an emission of the heat from the surface in the massive warehouse and the temperature differential with that in the air. So my extrapolation in the last couple of days is definitely going to have to get retracted. But ultimately speaking, this is, again, a combination of the both. I, I told I 100% agree. It's like it's hard to – it is hard to um, pull them out from one another. And that's the problem I've been having with, like, a calculator is, is how do you quantify without knowing, like, so many variables, you know? Um, what, what is standard? Right? What's standard upward refraction? What am I even gonna? So I, I kind of do that later on. Um, I don't know if we'll get to it or not, but but um, you're right. So how much is being pushed down by upward refraction, and how much is diffraction? But what's interesting here is that I think very little of this in this particular case is getting pushed down by by upward refraction. Um, I, because the reason is because this 1.75 inches is is essentially exactly almost one arc minute. Um, worth of loss. Um, so when you do 1.75 inches at 460 feet, you plug that in and it comes out to 0 0.018 um, loss of angular resolution. Um, and so you can extrapolate out what his camera height or what his camera would see across, um, you know, as this lid kept moving out and, and kind of descending further and further away, um, you get to roughly that he would lose, uh, you know, if he were a six, if this lid were a six foot man, he would disappear at 3.6 miles given this angular resolution limit. So again, a lot of it's chicken or the egg, but I think in this case, um, 
because there's the, the viewer height is so low to the ground, I don't think we're seeing a lot of upward refraction phenomenon. Maybe if you were viewing like a, a building, right, then you would see maybe a lot more of those kind of effects. But um, I think you're just seeing a little of emission fraction from the floor and it's getting, it's starting to reflect the ceiling. But I don't think the lid, the lid is um, essentially, I think that the layer has essentially dissipated by, you know, maybe one inch off the ground um, in this particular case. The thing that I would um, talk about here is that obviously we're looking across just, um, you know, a, a surface rather than two mediums. So we're not looking across uh, water and then air. We're just looking across a surface with air above it. Um, so, you know, when we're trying to look across, um, you know, hills and mountain ranges and stuff, if you're looking across mountain range to mountain range, you know, you can see much further things that we've seen recently. We've seen some guys that have put videos out um, and they've seen 100 miles, 120 miles away. And, you know, the seeing stuff that they shouldn't see. And yet with the water, this is where this, you know, because the majority of people live next to water and it's always the water that's the defining thing. You know, if you can see across a bay, if you can see across a lake, you know, if you can see across an estuary. Um, and this, to me, doesn't really hold sway with what we're talking about across water. This is totally different, isn't it? Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I think you are seeing a little bit of upward uh, an emission. I just don't think the layer is very is very big here. I think that most of this is is diffraction. Um, um, so, so does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it, it literally is. I mean, because Nathan talks about diffraction, but can you quantify diffraction over water? Because what you're looking at right now is diffraction over a, a hard surface mm -hmm. as opposed to water. We, I think the point is that water is water messes up everything, right? It just it, it convolutes this problem tremendously. Um, I, I, I think that's the bottom line. I, I, that's kind of what I came to with the, the, the time-lapse footage was just that, man, how can you make a determination when, when it moves like that? So. Yeah. Skunk base sums it up so beautifully because if you take any one of that, I don't know how many hours, is it eight hours or 12? It's, I think it's like 12 hour time-lapse. Yeah. So if you like one minute. Yeah. So at any one point, so rather than, so you take one photo at, at one second and call that 8 a.m. And then you, you take out a different photograph that's at, at 30 seconds, and that's essentially 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But what they present side by side is completely different. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so he did it again with, um, with, uh, with another lid example here. And, um, and so... Uh, you can see this lid here moving across and as it gets lower um you can see it kind of descend into the floor and uh when it does so you can kind of stratify these um these lid lines i guess um uh, and you can see that the lower uh the blue line here kind of starts to um you know descend into the ground and it gets lost so i kind of stratified out here the orange and the, the yellow um and just kind of marked them out. And you can see that the dot in the middle of the lid too, it gets kind of lower. Um, and you see that you lose this entire, this thing gets gradually lower, boom, boom, boom. And it's, and it's gone by the 460 or he didn't, he didn't say in this one, I don't think how many feet he was away. Um, but, um, but it, it, I think essentially did the same kind of experiment that day. It's the same warehouse and same floor and everything else. But, um, but the, the effect is, I just wanted to show the effect here for that one. Okay. okay so so there was a, a gentleman called nick havoc that did a video about um a pikes peak in colorado and he was essentially looking at 132 miles across um uh, you know land rather than water and <clears throat> you know he saw it completely you know there was no issue with it um is that is, is it a problem that for you that they have a mile higher in Colorado across that plane? 
So yeah, I, I've looked at a lot of those. Um, again, your your observer height. If you're higher up, this you, you know you're not viewing the world within a compressed view at all. You're not reaching theta. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, hang on, wait a minute. So he's a mile higher than the the circumference of the Earth. Let's say you know. Let's 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 go along with this that there's a circumference to the Earth. So he's a mile higher than this. But the mountain range that he's looking at in the distance is also a mile above the sea level. So essentially, they're on the same kind of diameter. Uh, right. Okay. So there's there's no difference between the two. It's just a larger ball because he's at a mile above sea level. The mountains above, uh, you know, a mile above sea level. So essentially, they're just bigger, further apart. So. If they're seeing each other, you know, or he's viewing the mountain in its entirety, is would you think that that was like cheating in some way, or would you actually think that well, you know, actually he is actually seeing this without the effects of uh, some kind of blockage in the way? Well, I guess it might be getting late. I'm, gonna, I'm having a hard time kind of following the the thing. So, um, so right, okay, so. Break so, it down for me. He, he's at a mile. He's at a mile high. He's in uh, near Denver or something, and he's viewing. He, uh, he he's a mile above sea level. Okay. The mountain is a mile above sea level. Okay. And then it has a prominence. So right. it, it has a prominence, and he can view it, and he sees all of the prominence. Okay. Right. At one hundred and thirty-two okay. miles. Got it. There shouldn't be any issue there. No. Look, so, so again, here's J Max uh, thing here. So his eye line is at the peak, right? He's at 5,382 5, feet. This peak is 5,380 feet. This peak here is 5,395 feet. It's just slightly above, which makes sense, right? That's what I was trying to, to show here that it's 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 just going to move away in a straight line. And the bottom of the peak is just going to, you know, if this, if let, let's say we do another, you know, 20 mountains all at the same elevation. They're just going to ascend within your view and get smaller with distance, but the peaks will stay at this red and purple line. Okay. I think I think the point that Travis is trying to get across, uh, not on this frame, but where we were a minute ago, was that it's it's not necessarily about the prominence because that's not going to help you in any way. You're still looking over the same deck even if you're higher, but you're not looking over water anymore. So what what's making the problem significantly worse is this temperature differential that you get when you're looking over water. Now, in a, a minor degree, Zach has replicated that in his warehouse, but that's really not the focus here. It's it's more of the very small amount, we're talking a few centimeters of this paint can lid, that disappear as he backs away from it because it's lost to the diffraction limit. Yeah, essentially. <laughs> yeah, the water messes up everything. Um, okay, well, have you got much more to discuss on this, or have we got a few more slides? Or yeah, no, sorry. Let me um, let me just go through. So that that that's essentially, I think, like you know, the world, right? So what what I think is going on within a lot of these these um, imaging effects, and then I just kind of go through, uh, and I'll just do this, touch on this briefly. How how I think they might have derived the the radius from um, from a curvature rate. And I kind of break out the, the triangles and things. And again, I'm assuming that they essentially took the average man and what they would see and what they would see disappear. And they used a fraction and they didn't factor in the refraction because of how variable it was. And they wanted to see what's the absolute. And they had two points of reference. They had a zero, zero, um, a zero point and they had a three mile point where the diffraction limit and, um, and uh, uh, would would essentially they use that as the as the two points with which they created the curve. So um, so here's the zero point, and then the curve point would be at three miles. And this person lost, um, you know, if you if you model this out orthographically, right? They're supposed to go straight across from you, but they went from six six feet straight across from you. They dropped to zero feet at this point, and then uh, along the curve, you they disappeared from your vision, right? Again, this is all assuming a curve. That this is from a curve, right? So they went from zero feet, then they dropped another six feet to vanish from your from from your point of view, and so they they walked over this curve at this rate, right? So a six foot person loses a six foot um, 
uh, object, I guess, across a curve at three miles. And so you break these angles out, um, and then that became the, the rate of curvature for the Earth. Um, and so you use that, that's th th these two angles here are gonna represent this arc angle here. Um, and then when you, um, I think it's Walter, who, who's the guy who has the new Earth curve calculator? Maybe it's not new. Uh, Bilslin or Bislin? Bislin. Yeah, so if you plug in um, a six foot man and what they would um, lose across three miles, you'll see that they have an angular, um, I forget what they call it, I, I have to go dig it out. But um, it's on the right hand side of his calculator, uh, an angular, um, oh, an angular, what does he call it? An angular arc rate or something, which is across the radius of Earth, what that would be. It's essentially this this pi piece right here, and it's exactly um, 0 0.0432, uh, right? So that that is the angle that they're assuming across the six foot man losing uh, six feet across three miles. So, and when you say that thing. six what feet that? losing six feet across three miles, he's dropping behind the curve, but he hasn't got smaller with distance. That's assuming exactly. he made the same size. That's exactly right. The curve. Yep. He didn't. He didn't. They they don't account for perspective, right? Um, so I kind of go through that here too. So um, so here's how I think they tried to account for perspective. And that's where I think eight inches per mile squared comes in a little bit more succinctly. So you can model this two ways. You can model this orthographic representation that I showed um, here, right? And broke out the triangle. So when you break out these triangles, you get one calculation for horizon gain and you get a calculation for height loss or drop, right? And that's why you have kind of two calculators plugged into an earth curve calculator. Um, you need one for how high you are and then for how much and then your distance and then how much you're going to lose. Um, but really all that horizon gain is, is this theta expansion rate and the and the loss rate is just how much how is the compression rate, right? We, and we've kind of gone through that. But to go back to this, so um, you can model this two ways, the same kind of relationship. You can say that the person stayed the same size and they moved and they dropped across an exponential curve. Or you can say that the person um, reduced in size exponentially at, across a standard drop rate, taken at three miles and um, for a six foot observer, right? So when you do that, this is where you derive eight inches per mile squared. So um, by by some, um, uh, it, it, let's say let's say this is my drop rate that I wanted to standardize the world to, this three foot at six across a across a uh, exponential height reduction, right? So I could say things get smaller with distance and this is the drop rate um, at which they experience things, right? So then you just take this line and you standardize across this person and you see that at one mile, he's lost maybe eight inches of his feet and you um, you standardize and then you drop him across uh, two miles and you see that he's lost about half of his body. At three miles, he's lost completely. And at four miles, um, there's about two, two of him and some change that are lost. And so what you end up coming out with is a constant and the constant is 0 0.666 um, feet of drop per the mile squared. Is this um, the same as Nathan's um, disappearing from the shoes up? Well, th this is just this is just kind of how I think things were worked out, I guess. No, um, no, 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 Ranty. This is the hijacking of perspective. Yeah, yeah I, I know that. But what I mean is when you say that people walk, you know, if you was to walk away, eventually the shoes would disappear and then the, the ankles would disappear, then the knees, then the, you know, this is the right, same thing. That's that's def in the, that's just diffraction, right? That's just angular resolution and how our vision works. What I'm saying is, and, and it's linear, right? What I'm saying is they can't, they can't do that because we live on an, a supposedly an exponential world, right, With, of curvature. Um, and so you can't have it both ways of, of like um, people getting smaller with distance and then exponentially dropping them off of a curve. It's, uh, it's empty's double dip, right? So if you're going to say that as somebody goes away from you, it's dropping around a curve, you can't simultaneously account for it getting smaller. I mean, the right. reality is it is just getting smaller. This is just perspective. But what they've done is they've, 
they've replaced the fact that somebody gets smaller with distance and said it's in line with this this um this formula eight inches per mile squared yep i i think that's that's what happened so um so the the the, the formula that's kind of how that formula gets worked out um and so then i kind of model it within like how that would set up so this person right here he's at one mile he's big right he loses eight inches here off of his feet this person here he's a little bit smaller he's one fourth the size right one over d squared so he's one fourth the size here at two miles and so he has a factor of a 0.66 added onto that right so it goes one four nine right it's one over uh, one squared one over two squared one over three squared one over four squared so he this guy here he has about half of his body cut off this guy here you know he's got all of himself gone right i'm just showing this is the yeah, the orange line i just moved it over right into into a perspective view and then this guy here at four miles you're losing about 10.6 feet or whatever it is comes out to 10.6 feet lost at uh at that rate and so anyway th does that kind of make sense it's interesting to me i guess makes sense to me so um you know how, how they how they did it or, or or i think i think it was kind of an attempt to model it this way was was like okay no things do get smaller with distance but but they have to they have to give it kind of an exponential spin um they can't have it linear and like nathan said it's, it's just not perspective is just not factored in so um so then just wrapping up here i have this this uh this is their curvature formula for this for a circle right for a spherical loss and um the math is here if you want to look at it but it's it's h equal to r minus r cosine of whatever this angle is that you're looking at across your drop um because the eight inches per mile squared actually works out if you're looking at this from like a 90 degree tangent here um this works out like a, a parabola right someone went out and did all the all the plug in and this is more, this is a parabolic loss. It doesn't come around back again and become a circle. Um, but so up to about 100 miles, the the eight inches per mile uh, squared works. They just they just split themselves across the bulge. Um, they assume that they don't look at anything with a straight line. Um, that your feet are always curved upward or your eye line is always looking downward across a bulge. Um, and so. Um, um, Anyway, they've split the number in half, uh, so the the drop rate isn't quite as substantial as um, as as they always um, or as you think it is, I guess, with eight inches per mile squared. When you plug in eight inches per mile squared, you get a pretty dramatic uh, drop rate. But what they end up doing is they just cut that in half. There's a lot of uh, six 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 in this and numerology. Uh, yeah, I kind of it was kind of on purpose, but um, so uh, if you look at the differences between the um, spherical loss and the uh, parabolic loss, right? They're, all these are roughly the same w uh, within a certain amount of time or a certain amount of distance. And then everything starts to diverge away. So the linear loss, right, I'm, I'm saying here is, is theta, right? Um, then you have this parabolic drop rate, and then you have the, the, the circular drop rate across vast distances, okay? Um, so, um, all right, and then... Uh, I know this is dragging on. I just want to add one more thing to that. Sorry. If you yeah. just go on frame. So th the reality is the linear loss. That's what we actually see, correct? Yeah, exactly. Right. So where Anthony in the past has said, when you go beyond a certain distance, it gets exponentially worse. Well, it's actually even worse than that because that would be based on the middle line that you've got that's called the parabol the parabolic loss. That's what they're uh, calculating. Well, say that one more time. So, so you're saying the parabolic loss. So I'm, I'm saying the parabolic loss is shallower. Um, yeah, if you shallower. take it as eight inches per mile squared. Yeah. So what we're calculating as how much we should or shouldn't be losing on a ball is the parabolic loss versus the linear loss, which is what we actually see. And you're saying within that little tiny box at the top, there's virtually no difference between all three, the circumference, the parabolic loss, and the linear loss. It's only as you get out further that you see more. But what we would be comparing it to when we get out to 100 miles, 200 miles, whatever, is the parabolic loss. But in reality, the actual circumference of the presupposed Earth is far worse 
Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's worse. <laughs> it, it drops off more. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but what they do is they, they just compensate for that by by splitting their observer height across eight inches per mile. So, but no, no, but you're you're right, Nathan. I, I'm getting I'm kind of tired now. But um, yes, the 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 spherical loss is much greater at higher distances than the parabolic losses. That's the bottom line. Hey, well, guys, if you if you want to wrap it up right now, you know we can always uh, reconvene it another time. We have been going for five hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, just, uh, so, um, of the parabolic loss rate, you can invert that and you get to the horizon gain formula. And that's how you do that here. I just show that. Um, and then I just kind of wrap things up with, you know, how this was the, this is the mirage, right? This is all loomed upward. You can't see any of the Chicago skyline because it's being loomed, um, completely within view, um, which is just, it's just, it's nonsense. So, um, because it's, he's done several time lapses. And this thing just barely, <laughs> barely budges, right? Just the floors and things kind of ex expand and compress here and there, just like in Skunk Bay. And what's cut off and what's probably brought down just a hair is what we've already shown is is more likely the phenomenon that's occurring. Um, so uh, this was kind of the bottom line here that, uh, you know, this is how we view the world. The, the, the things get smaller as they move away and your horizon rises to eye level. You don't continually shift your eye level downward to see a falling horizon. And um, I think that just kind of sums it up. And I just kind of snapshot all the earth curve calculators and how that they've modeled that this must occur um, for you to have a uh, horizon be a physical bulge of earth. So, um, and then uh, I just kind of tie things in with kind of what's going on in the world a little bit. Um, and I mean, then... You've covered yeah. it quickly because of ranty, and I know I, I know it's like it's like nearly two a.m. and I'm I'm keen to get to bed too. But covering the Sagittarius and how they forced us to look down and things, it th that's a show in itself. I mean, I really hope you'll do more with this because this has been just the best five hours ever. I've got to be honest; I didn't know it was that long. The time has really flown. Yeah, it's it's, it's been a long time, but um, yeah, hopefully some some good info was put out, and we can kind of. Um, you know, continue to put our heads together and some of this stuff. So, um, uh, I'll just kind of cover this. This, this is kind of the preliminary rules. Um, I got to kind of, um, get these a little bit more tight, but I'll, I'll kind of want to put things down into two, two slides, um, where, um, you know, things get smaller with distance. These are the, uh, the reasons small, small things disappear and then small things disappear with distance secondary, the compression rate within a given field of view. And then if your compression rate is along a floor and you're equidistant from everything, what would happen if your compression rate is along, uh, you know, a tangible surface and it's differential, meaning you're closer to something than another and how that would affect things. And then a little bit about optical density. And, um, and then I have a, a calculation here. So the calculation I come out to is 0.277 feet uh, per mile squared, essentially. Um, and I go through kind of how I derive that. I'm not saying that this is going to be the final thing, but um, I've kind of taken I've essentially what I've done. And then I'm just going to go through real briefly, like just like, you know, representative diagrams for each one. Right. So small things disappear, show a little bit of the airy disks and small apertures and kind of how that formula plays out. Uh, things get smaller with distance, you know, showing F2, um, F1 and kind of how your retina works and all, all the lens um, convergence. And then, um, diffraction and optics and how uh, theta is uh, comes into play with within perspective and, and uh, viewing things within compressed visual field lines and um, you know how angular size is affected and, and so on and then uh, going through refraction of light kind of all the stuff we've talked about with uh, you know uh, uh, reflections and refraction and critical angles and, and the inferior mirage and all that and then a little bit about how the differential compression rate occurs um, and we kind of bring the visible world lower uh, and appear to gain height. Um, and uh, and then kind of sum it up with um, some calculations. So, um, so and this is how I derive the formula and what I assume um, is what's really happening. So the curvature model assumed within standard terrestrial refraction as 7.6R, um, I reverse it and flip it to um, 
to take into account that I believe that they've taken into consideration, not, not knowingly that they took into consideration diffraction loss, but more unknowingly and, and perspective, right? They, they didn't take it into consideration. And so, um, so I've just assumed, uh, reversed everything. So here's the seven, six R curve, right? Um, as a greater curve or, uh, you know, a, a less, um, uh, uh, less curved than earth, right? Um, and then I just assumed that that was potentially the, the rate of um, upward refraction uh, that was misinterpreted and uh, across a straight level surface. And then um, anyway, I don't wanna get, I'm probably getting, getting too late, but uh, uh, I do some calculations here and uh, using this formula, um, you see this lighthouse here. This is uh, Jose's uh, lighthouse. Each stripe is 20 feet, and I calculate 84 feet missing, um, which is right here at this line, and which is right about here when you do the little blink test that they uh, kept showing. Um, this is another view of the CN tower, and doing this calculation using these other assumptions here, it's 275 feet missing, uh, and the Rogers Center is 282 feet tall, so maybe about a seven foot difference there. And then this is a uh, the Chicago uh, skyline footage um, with uh, 311 South Wacker Street, with this, which is this building right here versus the Willis Tower. And um, I calculate about 837 feet missing. Uh, this building is about uh, 960,000 feet tall, give or take. Um, so it's pretty close. It gets a little bit off there. But, um, but anyway, uh, just some, but my whole point with this is I kind of just sum this up right here. The point of a calculation is to show that you can get a better estimate for a hidden height by a reversal of standard terrestrial refraction and no additional curvature. In reality, refraction is highly variable, and when they, uh, and when very little is present, objects disappear at the angular resolution limit. Um, and my my overall point is that if you need a calculator, um, you can just derive one, right? Using using kind of um, just just some some faulty assumptions and reversing. Um, like the assumptions that have been made about this whole thing. Um, and uh, so anyway, if you need a calculator, uh, you can use this. Um, uh, make sense? I don't know. Well, Travis. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you don't need a calculator. I, that's my point. You, you just need to understand what's going on. So. Well, well Travis, tomorrow, uh, or, or any day really, uh, you know Nathan does... Um, shows at like 2 p.m in the uk so that's like 12 hours from you right now it you know is there a possibility at some point that you could actually jump on the show yeah no i don't, I don't mind that it, there's often the time difference is a little bit um i usually just kind of listen on my way to work and and on my way home and that kind of thing but um but yeah it, um if, if there's if there's a time in the day um tomorrow tomorrow's like super bowl day i guess right yeah yeah <laughs> I don't know <laughs> But yeah, so um, yeah, I, I can jump on. What what time? Well, just, just I'm at, I'm at tomorrow, so I'm actually because I've got a have very heavy workload. I'm going to take a day off just so I don't burn out. So it's going to okay, be yeah. the next day will be Monday, and you'll be at work potentially. Yeah. But yeah, if there's an opportunity, it's it's always open. The doors always open. It'd be great to see you on the debate. But to be perfectly honest, this has been far more valuable than you being on the debate. So Ranty's platform, doing this the way you've done it, I, I, I've never, this has been a fantastic presentation. Well, you know, the thing and what I get experience wise with commenting with people is that they don't really want to see your point. That's the hard part um, is is they don't really want to they don't really like open their um, their possibilities to things. They just they just kind of keep obfuscating. And then and then after a certain point, they do. Well, what about this then? And and now you're on to to something else, and it's like not your show, but like how it is in my comments, right? Like, well, well, then how can you can't explain this then? And it's like, well, mm -hmm. how do we just leave the other topic? Okay, you know, I don't know. So, well, I'll plug my own show. This is the end of Rantis, so you can see exactly that with Wiggles on tomorrow's show, which will go out at four p.m. UK time on Nathan Oakley, nineteen eighty. It's just the show that was recorded maybe six or seven hours ago today. Or well, yesterday is the time, maybe it's two in the morning now. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I know Ranty will round out as well. But I want to say a massive thank you to you. It's been an absolute pleasure, Travis. It's been really, really good. Yeah, uh, thanks. I appreciate everyone. Um, sorry I got it so late. 
No, no, it's fine, mate. It's fine, mate. Listen, Travis, Travis, you're absolutely welcome to come on anytime. Just, just send me an email. I will absolutely present you every single time. Love your work. Um, Life is short is the name of the channel. We have Red Pill Philosophy, who's been here for the entire time. Do you want to say anything, Red Pill? I'm still here, man. <laughs> wow, you're still here, man. Jeez, <laughs> six hours and you're still going. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you do a, a flat earth debate later as well. No way in hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nathan, Nathan. Here, listen, listen, Nathan. Nathan, um, can you give any advice to Chris? Because <laughs> Chris did a, a flat earth debate open panel yesterday and he had all kinds of people like Gem Panda, um, uh, you know, and, uh, et al., you know, let's say Gem Panda et al., that, that jumped on and it was six or eight against one. Is there anything you could, any advice you could give to him? Yeah, man, it's baptism of fire. I thought it was excellent. I watched the show actually around here. It was, it was, it was good. It reminded me of some of the early debates and exposing what I hope to expose. So, you know, it, it's at Chris's detriment and uh, it is in response then, no way, I'm not doing it. Yeah, I get it. So yeah, Nathan, Nathan, I don't know how you do that shit seven days a week, man. I, I don't know how you do that. It brings a smile to my face seeing you do it, though. So, you know, bring on more. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. So, yeah, yeah, guys, uh, life is short. Definitely go over there and subscribe. He's done five hours of presentation uh, this evening. I'm sure you, all you guys were blown away by the work that he's done. Nathan, everybody knows him. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, Nathan's got a Patreon, literally. It's Mr. Nathan Oakley. Uh, uh, I found out who my Patreon was. So, Darren Campanella was my first Patreon. Wow. Do you realize that you have, you actually have three Patreons and you've got $72 already? Amazing. But big shout out to Darren. But Darren popped my cherry as far as Patreon's concerned. And uh, yeah, big shout out to him. Darren is a. <laughs> And we got uh, Red Pill that's in the house. We got Red Pill with his "The Earth is Cat." So if you want to, if you want to buy the Earth is Cat T-shirt, <laughs> this is this is the channel you need to go to. Two hundred thousand subscribers, and he's growing fast. Uh, I hope to have him on to to, to discuss, um, it, you know, equality. I would like to discuss that with him. I really would. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do that. Let's let's plan something next week. Let's have a chat about that because I actually feel there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than 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 what we're led to believe. Okay. Okay. Right. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, this has been awesome. It's like six hours of constant flat earth. And thank you for all the panelists for being here. And I'm going to round out now. Thank you very much, everybody. And I will see you in the next hangout. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. See you later. Later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.